will go first a little bit over the uh, program for this lecture session and what I think we should be covering. Uh, first, we'll look at principles, just a brief introduction, what this is all about, why we care. Um, then we look at the nutrient cycles, and that's also the part where we will spend a little bit of time discussing today. Uh, nutrient functions in plants, uh, we'll touch that only briefly, but it's really important to know, uh, at least um, as a starting point, which nutrients are doing what in plants, in what amounts do we need it there to be able to understand why it is significant for a particular nutrient to be uh, available in soil. Uh, and then we look at the amount of nutrients in plant and soil, the nutrient forms in soil, and that will inform us a lot about the processes that we need to look at. Um, the processes controlling nutrient availability, and here are a few <coughs> keywords that are particularly important for that. Environmental factors affecting soil fertility, um, soil factors, uh, climate, uh, etc. Then soil fertility evaluation, how can we assess whether a soil has a lot of nutrients uh, available for plants or not. And there are several possibilities to that. Then we go into nutrient management. Uh, how can we improve soil fertility and nutrient availability? Um, but then quickly go also in the, into the environmental hazards because that is, uh, goes side by side <coughs> usually. Uh, then we look at a few specific effects, the water effects, salinity effects, acidity effects. Um, on soil fertility and nutrient management um, because they're uh, pretty widespread and have very particularly constraints on nutrient management. And then we look at, uh, in the last session, just featuring the fertility of uh, some peculiar soils um, that I like best. We'll look at, use case studies to do that. Part of them you do by reading assignments and uh, we'll discuss them at great length in, in the um, sessions here, so we'll, we'll form groups, and you will see that during this um, session. Why do we care? Why do we need to know anything about uh, nutrient management, uh, soil fertility? Um, there's really the uh, huge demand now for increasing uh, food production because we have an increasing world population and an increasing demand of food per capita. Um, there is a limited area for expansion of agricultural activities and associated, especially in our areas, but increasingly also now in uh, 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 developing countries, large environmental threats that are associated with food production. We need definitely a better food distribution um, in the world. There are areas in the world that have um, very advanced agricultural practices and can produce a lot, whereas other areas are lagging behind. Uh, we need a sustainable production without feeding on the natural resource capital. You see here an example um, uh, of compilation of data of, of supply and demands of grains for um, the past and projections for the future. Here you see the developing countries uh, have an increasing demand um, and uh, the production, which is the lower of these two lines, uh, lags a bit behind for the last 20, 30 years already, and the projection is that that will continue to, do, uh, to be the case in the future. And in um, 2020, we have a, uh, about a 10-year lag behind uh, cons uh, production and uh, demand of, of grains. Whereas in industrialized countries, you see here, the demand <coughs> barely goes up over the last 40 years, and the projection um, is also that the demand will not go up in the future and that uh, demand and supply are sort of in the same order of magnitude. So here we already see where the big problem lies in world food production, um, mostly in developing countries. If we break up this uh, data into different areas of the world, you can see here the production in kilogram per capita. Um, while Asia has over the past 40 years uh, picked up uh, production per capita. Uh, Africa, for instance, shows a decline in uh, production, uh, food production per capita over the last 40 years. And um, if we look at the uh, area in hectare per capita for food production, we see that all the areas in developing uh, countries decrease uh, in uh, in the area um, per capita over the last 40 years. 
Um, and uh, that is, of course, uh, a very dramatic, especially in Africa. And you see here vaguely a, a, a photo of an area, very, very densely populated areas, uh, where land holdings um, at the moment, for instance, in Malawi or Kenya, uh, are less than a hectare per family. And under these uh, circumstances, you can imagine that it is very hard for, um, for the population to, to sustain their livelihoods uh, based on agricultural uh, productivity. Um, but there is a, a huge potential. If you look at data like this here, um, where we can see that the pre-1930 yield in Minnesota was just two tons of uh, corn per hectare. Um, what, what are corn yields now, for instance, um, in, in parts of the developing world? Joseph, what, what do you, what, what's, what's the maize yield in, in Kenya? and three tons. So two tons is probably a good yield, not, a, not ecstatic, but, but it's a possible yield. It's probably, um, I'm not sure if it's an average yield, but it's, it's, a, it's a very common yield. So, uh, and, and we would call that probably not a, a high potential yield. I mean, the potential even now um, in areas of Western Kenya are probably much higher than, than two tons per hectare. Though in, in uh, the 1930s in Minnesota, the yield, the average yield, was uh, two tons per hectare. So that's pretty low. But over the last 80 years, um, the, uh, there was a dramatic increase through, for instance, using hybrids, through using fertilizer, through herbicides, et cetera, et cetera. And they all add up so that we have now, in the late 70s, recorded an average yield of uh, over six tons. So that only happened in the last 80 years, 70 years. That, that is not impossible, and that is a recent history that this increase happened. Um, so there is a lot of potential also now in these areas that uh, have not had yet this advance in agricultural productivity and management. And you can see here the increase um, of using fertilizer, and it's dramatic. It's two tons per hectare over these four tons just by using fertilizer N. So nutrient management is on the top of the list of uh, management practices to increase uh, productivity. But associated with that, right to give us one on the head, is um, larger environmental threats are associated with this. So this is the, the flip side of the coin, and, and we, we cannot ignore that. Um, here's a map of the United States. So Minnesota is, of course, in the United States. Um, and you can see here the percent of samples exceeding drinking water standards for nitrate. So the same nit nitrogen that we applied uh, is probably uh, nitrified, if not already applied as nitrate. And then a large portion of that ends up in drinking water reserves in groundwater. And you see here there, um, the occasions that greater than 15% uh, of the samples exceed drinking water standards um, is uh, not uncommon uh, around here. Up here here in the in the east, but also in the west, and a large percentage um, or a significant portion has uh, occurrences of, um, of exceeding the uh, drinking water standards. Only a very few are in the green area. So that's, that's pretty frightening, actually. Um, and that's the US. There are areas in the world where this is much, much greater the problem. Um, you see here just a blurb that uh, several investigations uh, found that in China, up to 50% of the water resources were above the critical WHO limits for drinking water. That's quite a lot of, a lot of water that, that is contaminated. And, uh, and we have to really pay attention to that. Um, what that does also to ecosystems, not on, to, only to our drinking waters, is uh, a phenomenon that, that you probably all are familiar with because it's in the press um, also in this area. Uh, we have agricultural runoff and leaching, and both nitrogen and phosphorus end up in uh, our surface waters and rivers and streams and lead to algal bloom um, and uh, dying of fish, et cetera, et cetera. So it has a, a, a huge um, uh, implications for our ecosystem dynamics. Um, the great challenge now is that, that these connections between how much do I put on and how much ends up in my water, in my drinking water or in my surface water is unfortunately not a trivial relationship. 
And that's why we are in business. Um, we want to find out how this relationship works. Um, and you can see here, for instance, in, in this compilation of, of data, that the authors related the nitrogen load in kilograms per hectare, so how much do I put on, uh, on my fields, uh, nitrogen, um, to the nitrate and nitrite concentration um, in, uh, in the groundwater. And you can see here that this is not really a linear relationship. Um, it, it can go anywhere. This is just a huge cloud of data. Um, and so there's not a, not a straight correlation, and it really depends on many factors, one of them being soil factors, one of them being climatic factors, geological factors. Um, you can see here uh, there are um, areas where when you add nitrogen, the uh, concentration of nitrite plus nitrate in the groundwater hardly increases. And then there are areas where it immediately increases already with 50 kilograms. So you, you can't really predict it unless you know something about the ecosystem. And a large portion is what happens in soil. How, is it, how does nitrogen, for instance, cycle in soil? And that's what we want to learn in this course. One aspect um, concerning the uh, soil fertility and the nutrient supply for plants um, is um, that we, we want to consider what, what actually is soil fertility. Why, why do we talk about a fertile soil uh, and an unfertile soil? Um, we here in this class emphasize the supply of nutrients, but of course there are other factors, uh, water and air, um, for instance, that, uh, that affect soil fertility. Um, if we look at nutrients, um, we are probably defining that by the supply of nutrients by the type and amount of nutrients um, that are important. So it's important which nutrients and how much is there. And that is actually a measurement according to plant demand. So it's not an absolute term. We don't really know if 50 kilograms of nitrogen in the soil, available nitrogen, is a lot or not a lot. We have no idea unless we define it in a context of a particular crop or um, a particular ecosystem or a particular soil. Uh, and an example here is, for instance, where uh, different uh, plants have been grown in a, a solution and they have been offered 25% of the nutrients offered were potassium in the soil solution, in the solution uh, calcium 25, magnesium, and sodium 25. Corn took up 70% of the nutrients were potassium of those four nutrients. So although they were offered 25, they accumulated 70. So it seems that they have preferred potassium over all the others. Um, uh, whereas potato wasn't so interested in the potassium, but uh, accumulated a little bit more of calcium and magnesium uh, in comparison to the corn. And a halophyte, for instance, atriplex, um, even like the sodium, whereas usually uh, a lot of the cultivated plants, crops, don't really uh, like sodium. Um, the halophyte, as the name already says, um, can accumulate salts and uh, accumulated 20% of those four nutrients uh, were sodium. Um, so not all plants are created equal, so it depends also on the plant um, what they actually need. And, and that is also how nutrient availability is usually determined. To wrap this up, uh, what we are interested in in this course is the relationship of the plant with the soil. So we're interested how much of the nutrients uh, are taken up, uh, which nutrients these are, um, and the interactions in the soil, um, how soil properties, environmental properties, and uh, management fertilization, organic and inorganic fertilization, affect these uh, properties of soil that are responsible for uh, plant nutrient supply. Um, whereas nutrient return, nutrient losses, and land use systems and soil, um, part of the soil management, that is something that we um, uh, cover later in the course. Uh, and now I would like you to uh, form groups and we'll um, look at the nutrient cycles. Um, this gives us a good start in, into what 
uh, processes are really important for which nutrients. And if I can ask you to form groups of about four, if you four could go together, um, maybe the three of you and the three of you. And we can all come forward. And um, each of you, group one, takes the nitrogen. Group two can take phosphorus. And group three can take potassium. And you're free to take a crayon um, and uh, start drawing the nutrient cycles up here. <coughs> Please. Well, you can't hear this in often enough, uh, so I'll, I'll reiterate that here now. So we have all these nitrogen pools, the atmospheric N, uh, important for nitrogen, soil organic nitrogen, important pool, nitrate ammonium, nitrous oxide ammonia. Um, we have numerous fluxes here. You see a whole list of fluxes for, for the nitrogen cycle. Mineralization, immobilization, these are biological phenomena. Denitrification can be biological or, or uh, abiotic. Um, ammonization, nitrification, ni uh, ammonification, leaching, um, biological nitrogen fixation, a whole slew of processes uh, that are important for the nitrogen uh, cycle. Um, here again, what we just did in our uh, assignment and in our group discussion, um, we see here uh, a big box for soil organic nitrogen, soil organic matter, stable, labile, um, and then a big box of uh, um, um, inorganic nitrogen. We have uh, transformation of organic nitrogen into inorganic nitrogen, usually called ammonification because ammonium is produced. Uh, and then through a double step via the, via the nitrite uh, production of um, nitrate uh, in a process called nitrification, uh, mediated by um, specifically two different microorganisms. Does anybody know which microorganisms these are? Terra. Yeah, and the nitrobacter. So two different uh, uh, groups of, of um, uh, or two different bacteria, nitrosomonas and nitrobacter, that um, uh, mediate this, uh, this nitrification. And this step, especially in warm climates, is very, very rapid. Um, so under very many uh, circumstances, you don't have a large accumulation of ammonium. Um, then you have, of course, uh, leaching of uh, nitrate and ammonium. You have some fixation of uh, ammonium to mineral soil, adsorption of nitrate to mineral soil, all of it uh, often very weak. Um, you have a pretty isolated rock here, as we said earlier in the discussion. So there's not really anything um, going on uh, between rock and, and uh, the rest of the nitrogen fixation, uh, nitrogen cycle because we have uh, very little nitrogen um, in soil, in mineral, in uh, in minerals, in primary minerals that could be released by weathering, for instance. Uh, important process here, this um, nitrogen fixation through legumes, but there are also other um, free-living uh, fixers, for instance, in soil that can contribute some of the nitrogen uh, fixed. Uh, deposition through lightning, for instance, volatilization, so the gas phase is important uh, from ammonia or the denitrification process to N2 or N2O. Um, you see here already with these values, a large portion uh, of our nitrogen in our ecosystems is in the atmosphere, uh, and that's where the, where the microorganisms tap into. Uh, comparatively little here in, uh, in the um, inorganic soil pool, uh, quite an amount here in the, biologic, in the, in the plants, in the above-ground biology, um, more than inorganic, we have actually organic, usually 95% or more even of the total nitrogen. Uh, there is, in igneous rock um, in the earth crust, there is some nitrogen, but in our minerals, weatherable minerals, uh, usually very little. Nitrogen, uh, the sulfur cycles, um, actually, in some respects, very similar to the nitrogen cycle. We have also atmospheric um, sulfur, SO2, also particulates. We have a large pool, soil organic sulfur. Uh, we have inorganic components, sulfate that is then also taken up by the plants. Elemental sulfur in some instances, especially fertilized. Um, very similar processes as the nitrogen uh, cycle, mineralization, immobilization, leaching. Uh, we have uh, volatilization, for instance, of H2S. There are other forms, organic forms, COS. You don't need to know that at this point, but uh, important is that um, 
you can also have uh, sulfur, gaseous sulfur losses. Adsorption plays a role, uh, precipitation, uh, recrystallization, uh, and plant uptake, of course. Um, so you have, looks not too dissimilar from the nitrogen cycle, soil organic matter here, um, and mineralization to inorganic sulfur, um, uptake from uh, the inorganic sulfur by the plants. Um, you have uh, precipitation uh, and dissolution uh, with a mineral soil. You have some rock weathering, happens, uh, leaching and adsorption. Um, very little, though, of the sulfur is in, uh, in the atmosphere, uh, whereas we have a considerable amount in rocks, so the, the release or the input f uh, to soil is, is um, mainly by weathering. Uh, comparatively uh, little to the other, to this r immense rock pool than the uptake in plant biomass. Um, uh, quite a considerable amount in soil organic matter if you compare to the plants. Um, and it can be uh, quite a lot of inorganic sulfur in some soils um, that have uh, underlying rocks that have a lot of sulfur. That uh, skews a little bit, biases this, this number. Uh, unless you have, uh, if you don't have a lot of sulfur in the rocks, then it's very similar proportions to nitrogen. Uh, plant uptake in the area of 10 to 50 kilograms of sulfur per hectare and year. Uh, deposition you can see uh, can be very low, only 2 kilograms, but 20 sounds like it's already in the order of magnitude of plant uptake. So. Um, there is a considerable flux happening from the atmosphere back to the soil um, in, in an order of magnitude that, that is important. Um, do you know where, which, uh, which areas or, um, in the world receive a lot of sulfur dioxide inputs? Near industrial, Near industrial areas. Well, what's a, what's a very uh, famous area that received a lot? And the name was created to reflect that also. In Europe somewhere, on an island, where they speak English. <laughs> London smog. Um, so in the southern UK, um, because of coal firing in, uh, in the 1800s, you have an enormous amount of uh, uh, sulfur dioxide emissions and anthropogenic um, uh, and uh, production of, of sulfur dioxide and, and deposition. Um, and, and to an extent that, um, that produces also side effects, not only a sulfur input, but um, there, are other, there are other stories also. What's, what's a side effect of, of these anthropogenic emissions and depositions? Acid rain, that's, that's correct. Um, uh, you get uh, um, proton input from, from these anthropogenic depositions uh, and acidification that affects usually uh, forest ecosystems that um, uh, on higher elevations that really uh, browse, sort of speak, the, the, the fogs and the clouds and, and a lot of uh, dry and wet deposition um, of uh, uh, sulfuric acid and uh, sulfuric acid. And um, that leads to acidification of uh, forest and then forest decline also. Um, and we'll look at that later, actually. Uh, phosphorus gets a little bit less complex than nitrogen and sulfur, um, but there is a great deal of pool still to consider. There is a sizable amount uh, in soil organic phosphor and soil organic matter as soil organic phosphorus. Phosphate in various forms, that's a bit of a headache for phosphate, um, that it can uh, occur in different organic um, states, absorbed, solution, occluded, and we'll have to pay attention to that. Mineral phosphate is important, so the, the supply of, um, of phosphorus in soil comes from the rock. There is no phosphorus gas. Um, there's no phosphorus gas going out. There's no phosphorus uh, gas coming in. Uh, there might be some particulates, um, coming in, but uh, generally in very low amounts. P fluxes, similar to nitrogen and sulfur, we have mineralization, immobilization. We have some leaching, though in, under most occasions not a lot, um, accelerated a lot 
uh, under preferential flow conditions and maybe in some sandy soils, especially if we over fertilize uh, as, as happens in many industrialized countries. Adsorption, fixation, dissolution uh, are, are a big topic for phosphorus. Weathering is important um, and it's of course plant uptake. Here you see that cycle again, there's nothing written up here in the, in the atmosphere. Uh, pretty much the same dynamics as we saw it before for, um, for uh, uh, sulfur and nitrogen. Uh, here this precipitation dissolution um, complex with, with calcium precipitation or, um, or uh, fixation and formation of aluminum and iron phosphates. Some leaching, not much, adsorption uh, important and so-called fixation. And as I said, the weathering part is pretty important. Um, here you see already what, what this importance make up. All these, these uh, complexes here and the fixation makes up a large proportion usually in soil. More than 60% here on average uh, in this um, um, review uh, is in, in mineral form or in uh, uh, absorbed and uh, fixed form in the soil. Uh, whereas uh, only 13% are in soil organic matter, uh, so comparatively low amounts. Potassium, um, getting the list is low, gets lower here, uh, shorter. Um, we have uh, uh, soil uh, potassium in solution, absorbed, occluded. There's some some uh, um, meat to, to some uh, processes to to look at very closely we have mineral potassium but we don't really have any in soil organic matter we don't have gas uh, so it gets a lot uh, simpler here um, we don't have really mineralization immobilization um, there is of course potassium in plants and in manures and in decaying plants but um, it is usually leached very rapidly from that um, and it's usually not released to great extent by mineralization um, leaching is important uh, under many conditions. Adsorption, uh, fixation to minerals, dissolution, weathering, and plant uptake. Uh, here you say the amount of, of uh, boxes goes down. Uh, nothing up here. Soil organic matter only weak, um, uh, low contents, and not much replenishment of inorganic phosphorus by any biological um, processes. Some absorption happening, of course, um, onto soil organic matter or mineral soil. Uh, leaching is important. Some fixation actually happens and we'll look at that, these processes later on. Uh, you see here also similar to uh, um, phosphorus uh, and sulfur, we have a considerable amount of our potassium in the rock and that's the way uh, it goes, gets into soil. Uh, calcium, magnesium, quite similar, although the, the, the story about adsorption and fixation is a lot simpler, um, but other than that, very, very similar. Uh, micronutrients, um, very similar to that. Uh, not much um, mineralization, immobilization from soil organic matter, actually, um, but there can be some absorption and, and uh, complexation, actually, to a great extent, for, um, especially for copper, but we'll, we'll look at that later. Uh, weathering, again, rock minerals are, are important. Um, then some uh, rare micronutrients, molybdenum, boron, um, even to, to a lesser extent, uh, an a, um, uh, uh, interaction with, with soil organic matter, a little bit complexation, some mineralization happening. Uh, chlorine has only recently been appreciated as a essential uh, nutrient and you can see here much comes from uh, deposition actually not so much from rock weathering uh, why from deposition where would it come from from deposition what's a source of chlorine salts. salts yeah where do you find salts in the sea yeah so it's it's a lot comes from, from sea spray um, by atmospheric deposition in particulate form. Um, and that's, that's a major input uh, to soils. If we looked at that 
that's so small you can't even read it up there. Um, and I tried to color code a little bit. Um, blue for the sky, uh, brown for the, for the soil, organic matter, and, and this light blue for um, the dissolved uh, species. And you can see this is, this is very complex. Just to wrap this up, this is very complex nitrogen. Uh, sulfur gets a little simpler, phosphorus uh, much simpler already until we have hardly any, any pools interacting here for chlorine. Uh, so you can, can nicely see, uh, maybe, maybe you want to concentrate your research on chlorine. It's so simple. Uh, and, and if you tackle nitrogen, you already know what you're up for. Um, that, uh, before we go to um, nutrient forms and uh, nutrient amounts and functions in, in plants and soils, um, I want to spend uh, a little bit time on um, looking a little bit closer at the distribution. We, we have seen very schematically now these boxes that we painted here, um, like you see here. If I can get this up. In your pictures that you drew uh, a little earlier, you see um, that we, we drew these boxes here. And uh, um, you didn't really, there's not a spatial arrangement. I mean, you, you, you were drawing this to designate this is soil and this is air, and the plants probably sit on the soil um, and the cows and whatnot. But, um, but you didn't really care where, where that was. Uh, you painted here the non-exchangeable below the, the potassium in solution, but for no apparent reason other than, uh, than that to, to make up your space and to, to uh, draw your arrows. You probably put the leaching down, but you could have done that also any other way. Um, but we all probably sort of sense that there is no uniform distribution of nutrients down here. And uh, these stocks, um, these pools of nutrients are probably not uniformly distributed. These processes do not happen to the same extent everywhere in the soil. And to, to get a little bit of the se a sense of, of um, important differences here, um, we'll, look, uh, we'll look at some factors that could affect this. Geology, formation of soils, also use and uh, water dynamics in soils. Here are uh, some nutrient distributions for phosphorus. Here are phosphorus examples. And they depend on geological material, stage of soil development, and soil use history. Um, you see here, this is the, the y-axis is the depth in centimeters. Um, and then you have uh, this black area is the amount of organic phosphorus with depth, and then is the amount on top of is the amount of inorganic phosphorus uh, with depth, and then this line um, is then the total phosphorus. Uh, and you have different scenarios here, and you see they, they look pretty different. And now we do a, a little quiz and, uh, and see whether you can guess which soils are what. Where do they come from? What happened to them? Why does A look so different from G, for instance? So why don't you give me a, a guess? What, what is A, for instance? I mean, there, there are probably a, a few dozen answers to each of those scenarios. But uh, what, what could A be? Why is there more phosphorus in the top than down here, given what you now know about the phosphorus cycles? Why would there be more phosphorus and, and it seems the organic phosphorus is also increased. Yeah. Overuse yeah. of manure fertilizer. That's a possibility. Why do you think? Because as we, the, the uh, phosphorus comes from rock down below, right? There's a lot of it up there. And if there's such a huge concentration of it near the surface, then <coughs> there has to be some obvious surface source. And that a lot of times that's manure. That's, that's a good point, yeah. So if, if it was just a geological source, as we said, there is no phosphorus gas. It, it cannot come from the top in natural systems, uh, really, to great extents. If there's more up here, it's probably an anthropogenic source and some input. Why do you think uh, manure 
and not uh, phosphorus fertilizer. Here, here is as, as a lot of uh, the manure that uh, that we have to dip, uh, um, get rid of. Are, are but but from this from this uh, from this graph here, how could you argue that it could actually be manure? Yeah, 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 very good, yeah. So it's not only the inorganic phosphorus who goes up, but also the organic phosphorus goes up. And so you could argue that that could be due to application of, uh, of a phosphorus source that is mainly or, or a substantial portion of it is, is organic phosphorus. Uh, there are other possibilities. Um, I, I think that's a pretty good one already. Um, the, the next one here, what? What do you think B could be? Yeah, you could argue. Why, why do you think that this could be a chemical fertilizer? The inorganic is so much more. Because the inorganic is so much more increasing. Um, so it's probably, again, it's an anthropogenic source. Um, that's, that's a good, uh, good explanation. Yeah. Um, I'll... Uh, yeah, they just say cultivated loams here in this book, but, but I think our explanations go far beyond um, what they say. So it's, it's some anthropogenic activity that's happening here. Um, what about D here? What's D? What would you think? Following the thinking that we had earlier. Peter, you want to try again? For instance, yeah, so why do you think that's an uncultivated forest? Because it doesn't have a lot of fluctuation, it doesn't have a lot of addition. Yeah, so it, it goes down pretty straight down. There's no increase, no decrease really to speak of. Uh, what about the amounts? Th this is, should be at least to scale for the, so this is a lot and this is very little. So there's also probably no great input. This is much less phosphorus overall than those two. Yeah, it's probably... Uh, any uncultivated um, soil, and, and you're right, probably forest, because um, in, in most agricultural soils, even grasslands, very often you have some phosphorus inputs. Um, what would you think about E? This looks also interesting. What, what do you think is that? Helen? Yeah, so that it, you mean that, um, it, uh, it had received a lot of phosphorus uh, for a long period of time, so it, it maybe leached down or was by bioturbation worked down, so you don't have the decrease uh, with depth. That's a possibility, yeah. Any other ideas? I think this, this is pretty good. Um, uh, they say here, uncultivated calcareous. Um, and uh, in, in calcareous soils, uh, you ver very often have a lot of calcium phosphates, um, uh, also deeper down in the profile. Um, you can't really guess that. Uh, but um, what I find a little bit difficult to explain is the amar a large amount of organic P then in a calcareous soil. But so be it. Uh, G is, is then a very interesting, so it, it is exactly the opposite of A, uh, a, a low amount at the topsoil and then a, a high amount in the subsoil. What's your best guess what that could be? Really high phosphorus bedrock. High phosphorus bedrock could be, so with high phosphorus in your weatherable minerals, uh, underlying geological material, you probably have a lot of phosphorus down here. Uh, possible. What would be an argument against that? The that the organic is very high. Uh, and, uh, but it's a good idea that that could could happen, and especially if you take a lot, you have a lot of offtake by cultivation or so, um, then then uh, you could increase your phosphorus. But what would be another other with this high organic? Debbie. If you quit applying? Yeah. 
So you. Um, so you, you're, having, you're having an agricultural soil, uh, this, for very long periods of time, and then you stopped applying, and, and your offtake uh, exceeds your inputs that come into the soil. That's a good idea, and you probably would have, if you take this and do this for a few hundred years longer, or, or decades longer, then, then you probably have a, a more phosphorus also at depth, and then you start uh, depleting on the top. So that's a good example, yeah. Another possibility. Could this be a cultivated calcareous That's also a good possibility, yeah. Uh, following this, this uh, rationale and, and um, uh, yeah, that's a good possibility also. I want to have one more, yeah. Maybe a change in texture because it's a very sharp. Mm -hmm. So any layered, any layered um, material could, could affect the phosphorus profile that you have maybe uh, more phosphorus at depth in a different uh, geological material. There are a lot of soils around that have sand over clay or clay over sand and, and maybe a sandy topsoil from sand dunes or uh, aerial deposits over a more clay area. That's, that's a possibility. I would tease one more out. Um, and these are all possible uh, things. And if you think about the high organic matter content, a high organic phosphorus content. Like a peat soil or something. A peat soil, yeah. So, so um, well, they're low in phosphorus, not very high in phosphorus oh. availability, but they have a lot in organic matter. Because if you think that they, by definition, these peat soils have to have more than, depending on which classification you take, more than 15 or 20 or 30%. Uh, organic matter, then, uh, then if you calculate that, there's a lot of phosphorus then in organic matter. So this could also be um, a, a, uh, uh, a peat soil or, or, or a bog, um, and uh, that is very possible. H, the last one, what is that? You hardly can see it so small. It could be, actually, yeah, it could be a very young soil um, and uh, uh, a soil with, with, uh, on bedrock that has very little phosphorus, so sand dunes or something like that, um, uh, aeolian deposits, fluvial deposits of sand um, that only slowly build up some organic matter and organic phosphorus up here. Uh, that's that's a nice uh, explanation, yeah. Other possibilities. Uh, that's a good point. I th this is also this is another good possibility that this is a, actually a very old soil, uh, a highly weathered soil, a tropical soil maybe um, that uh, has little phosphorus compared to those soils here. Very little phosphorus, uh, majority in inorganic form because a lot is fixed uh, in inorganic form, and we'll we'll look at that later. Uh, there's a little bit organic phosphorus at the at the top soil. Um, but uh, overall, very little phosphorus. Um, that, that's a good possibility. And I think both, it could be a, a very, very sandy soil, a young soil, and it could be a very old leach tropical soil. So as you see, there are not, there's no true and false answer. There are just uh, ideas. Um, and, and following this, these processes that we have talked about, um, it's really possible to, to uh, assign history to, to some of these uh, profiles. Um, here another example, uh, this time for um, nitrate uh, and ammonium. Um, and also nitrate and ammonium is not distributed uh, equally in, in the soil profile. Um, you here see a, a nitrate in acid soil actually in Kenya from, uh, from our colleagues. Um, and you see here there, 
uh, is a steep increase uh, with depth up to one meter in um, adsorbed nitrate and available nitrate uh, under unfertilized corn even. Uh, and then a decrease. So you see there's a lot of nitrate available down here at one to two to three meter depth. Um, another example here from, uh, um, from uh, the Amazon, also in an acid soil, where you see that this uh, accumulation of nitrate is moving even deeper up to four or five meter depth. That's where we find the majority of the nitrate. It's not up here in the topsoil. Nitrate is quickly leached under these conditions into the subsoil. Uh, subsoil is acid, can absorb nitrate, and don't worry about it. We'll look at that later in detail, why that is so in these soils. Um, and you find this huge amount of, of nitrate. Um, some of these studies indicate that there's more nitrate absorbed at great depth than is accumulated uh, in the entire above ground biomass. So this is a relevant amount of nitrogen. Uh, ammonium, you see here, there's a little bit, uh, uh, a maximum here in the, at the topsoil, near the topsoil, decreases rapidly and then there are very low amounts in the subsoil. That's a very typical profile actually for ammonium. And it very often follows just the um, organic matter. So if you have more organic matter in a, in a soil uh, depth, then you find more ammonium. Uh, if you have lower amounts, then you find uh, lower amounts. So it's, a, it's very often, ammonium is very often boring to look at um, because it basically has a little bit more in the topsoil and then it decreases. Uh, it's not much to gain about. Um, so we, we have seen that there, that there uh, these uh, nutrients uh, are not um, evenly distributed in the profile and uh, I've shown you data that go up to four or five meter depth but if you see this profile here, these soils, um, deep oxysols here uh, are can be tens of meter deep. So we're talking about really deep soils. Uh, and there could be a lot of nutrients down there in some instances. Very often there, for many nutrients, there's almost nothing down there, nothing to be gained. Um, and maybe there's only water that the uh, roots are interested in. Uh, but in some instances, there, there could be a, a large volume be exploited by, uh, by plants. Um, soil water dynamics can play a role in, uh, in um, influencing this distribution of available nutrients. And here, for instance, for sulfates. So we'll move a little bit through nutrients. So you see that that can really happen for, for a variety of nutrients that, that um, uh, they're not equally distributed in the soil profile. Uh, you see here the B horizon in a soil uh, in a watershed in Germany. Um, the concentrations here per unit of dry soil, 37.1 milligram of uh, sulfur in the B horizon at 0 to uh, 0 0.5 meter. Uh, the total storage of that is 250 um, kilograms. But if you go deeper from 0 0.5 meter to 10 meter, um, the concentrations go down a little bit of inorganic sulfur, but the amounts, since it's a huge layer of soil, are so large. So you can see, although we have a higher concentration at the, near the sur surface, uh, the amounts of inorganic sulfate available to plants and stored in the soil are much greater in these deeper layers of soil. Uh, so it's important to recognize here that, um, that there can be important stores uh, down in the, in the subsoil. If we look now what the soil water does, here you see the amounts of sulfate um, in the... Uh, uh, soil solution uh, as a, a function of the depth of the groundwater for different groundwater uh, locations. And you can see um, in all ca almost all cases um, there is a negative correlation with the inorganic sulfur and the uh, depth of groundwater. That means the lower the groundwater, uh, the higher the groundwater rises, um, uh, the more inorganic sulfate um, is in the soil. And that has to do with uh, movement of sulfate that has a little bit to do um, with uh, mineralization and leaching dynamics. Um, but you can see, you pre I appreciate here that, uh, that sulfate uh, concentrations are, are to a large part a function of uh, groundwater depth. Um, and there's a little bit of a mystery 
still associated with, with sulfur in that respect. Um, and I think we'll leave this part uh, for next week, um, where we look a little bit as, at some case studies of nutrient cycles. Um, and uh, for this week, on Thursday, we'll again meet in 102 and uh, start our extraction procedures and our uh, uh, first uh, round of experiments that you do by yourself um, before we go into the teaching bit. Um, for those who do the, the growth experiment, uh, you've probably already seen there. Little maize plants are coming already out. Um, so you, you obviously uh, had uh, some success in, in putting your, your growth experiment together. Thank you very much. Um, I'll uh, please have a look again at your, your uh, laboratory procedure and uh, we'll meet on Thursday morning in 102. Thanks. <coughs>